is China's development and United States-Chinese relations. Um, nearly all Americans are excited uh, about China and its huge progress. And uh, it's undergirded by a great affection, which I think most Americans have for China. I've never met an American who's been to China who doesn't speak positively and enthusiastically about the Chinese people. And so we like to think that uh, with a few interruptions here and there, we've had a marvelous relationship with uh, uh, one of the world's most impressive peoples. Uh, our current policy, at least our policy, I think, for four decades has been accommodation with China as our central principle. Uh, certainly, those kind of positive enterprises uh, result in our wishing China the very best in its economic development, its important to the world, and the prosperity of its own people, which will follow. And we also know that the world needs China's widespread cooperation uh, if indeed we're to find a stable international order. The simple result is that most Americans wish China very, very well. <clears throat> Our guest this evening is the, uh, uh, holds the rank of minister. He's the deputy chief of mission at the Chinese embassy. That's the number two position. Uh, it's an uh, uh, all-encompassing job. Uh, some DCMs have different types of responsibilities, but it's essentially number two and, and very important to us. The minister uh, uh, spent seven years in the Shanghai School of Foreign Languages. He uh, graduated with a Bachelor of Arts degree with an emphasis upon law from the uh, uh, Foreign Policy University. His first uh, uh, interest within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs had to do with Great Britain. He was on the uh, British desk. He also served as the secretary to the uh, Chinese ambassador to Malta. He then spent seven years in the uh, Office of U.S. Affairs within the Department of North America and North American and Oceanic Affairs. And during that time, he was a staff member, he was deputy director, and finally became director of, of that office. Uh, and complete, with the completion of that, he served here in the United States in Washington. He served as the uh, counselor for a congressional liaison, and he was the spokesman for the Chinese embassy. And when he returned to Beijing, he held the uh, uh, Office of Counselor for uh, uh, Policy Analysis and Planning, and then served as Director, a Deputy Director General of, uh, of that particular operation, that is, the uh, North American uh, Affairs Department. Following that senior position, he came here to the United States as DCM about a year ago. It's my very great pleasure to present to you Minister Shea Fong. Well, President Burt, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, well, thank you, President Burt, for your very kind introduction. I myself do not remember in such detail my history. <laughs> I would also like to uh, thank the uh, Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs for the gracious invitation. It is a great pleasure to join such a distinguished group of people this evening in Baltimore. And I am very much impressed by the uh, big turnout this evening. And I am, as a foreign affairs major, I am really impressed by the enthusiasm and interest you have shown in foreign affairs in China and in the U.S. relations. As an important organization dedicated to educating citizens about foreign affairs since its founding in 1980, the Council has served as an eye-opener for the local community to know about the rest of the world. And this has helped promote the city's fine tradition of multicultural dynamism. I guess maybe that is why Baltimore is known as the charm city. Therefore, I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to share with you some of my views on China's development and China-U.S. relations. But ladies and gentlemen, 
This year marks the 30th anniversary of China's reform and opening up. I was just told by an old gentleman just now, he visited China in 1980, and that is exactly one year after China's adoption of the policy of reform and opening to the outside. In December 1978, at the initiative of the late Chinese leader Deng Xiaoping, the Chinese people took a decisive step along the road of reform and opening up. 30 years later, China has achieved a successful and historic transition from a highly centralized planned economy to a dynamic socialist market economy, from a closed or semi-closed society to one that is fully open to the outside world. China's economic achievement has been remarkable. Between 1978 and 2007, we sustained 10% annual growth rate on average and became the third largest economy in the world. From lack of food and clothing to moderate prosperity, people's living standards have been improved. Individual income increased by nearly six folds. Rural population in poverty dropped from 250 million to just over 10 million. China's relations with the world have gone through a historic change, with its share in the world GDP increasing from 1% in 1978 to 5% in, 19, uh, in 2007, and its share in global trade increasing from less than 1% in 1978 to nearly 8% in 2007. China now contributes over 10% of world economic growth and over 12% of international trade increase. China has also joined over 100 intergovernmental organizations, signed more than 300 international conventions, and participated in 22 United Nations keep peacing, uh, keep, uh, peacekeeping operations. We have contributed a total of over 10,000 peacekeepers, more than any other permanent member, members of the UN Security Council, which corresponds with the big population China ha <laughs> is having. <laughs> Despite the achievement, we are soberly aware that China remains the biggest developing country in the world. The challenges ahead, uh, that lie ahead are unprecedented in both scale and complexity. When our Premier Wen Jiabao you know, took office in 2003, he gave a press conference, and he described China as the following, that any major, no matter how major the resources, if it is divided among 1.3 billion people, then it becomes a very meager one. And any uh, minor uh, issue, if it's multiplied by 1.3 billion people, then it becomes a major, major issue. So this is the, uh, you know, I think a very vivid description uh, of what China really stands you know, at uh, this time. In 2007, China's per capita GDP was equivalent to 2,460 US dollars trailing behind the 100th place in the world. It is only about 1 18th of US per capita GDP. Meanwhile, our development is constrained by the shortages of resources and energy and environmental consequences. Urban rural discrepancies and regional imbalance are serious. Underdevelopment remains the reality in many rural areas, people, and especially in Western China. Over 10 million people still live below the poverty line. China's road to modernization will be a long one, and our tasks will be arduous. Therefore, the goal for the Chinese government and people in the coming years is focusing on development in order to build a well-off society for over 1 billion people at the higher level and in an all-round way realize basic modernization throughout the country and achieve common prosperity for all. As we strive to achieve this goal, we will remain committed to the path of peaceful development. China will strive for a peaceful international environment for its development while promoting world peace through its development. China's development is peaceful in nature. It will not harm or pose a threat to anyone. China does not seek hegemony now, nor will it do so in the future. 
we will unswervingly adhere to the reform and opening up policy. China will pursue economic and political restructuring and reform in a comprehensive way, explore and improve the development, of development model that suits China's national reality, and continue all around opening up in order to sustain long-term economic development and social progress. We will continue to adhere to the independent, inter, independent foreign policy of peace. Despite differences in ideology and social system, China is ready to establish and develop friendly relations and cooperation with all the countries in the world on the basis of equality and mutual benefits. We want to be friend to all and enemy to none. We want to be friends, you know, uh, the United States, the only superpower in the world is one of if not the most important partner for China. Maintaining and developing the constructive and cooperative relationship with the United States is by no means an expediency. It is in line with China's fundamental interests and the development strategy. Well, ladies and gentlemen, China's reform and opening up coincided with another important event, the establishment of diplomatic relations between China and the United States on January the 1st, 1979. Now, firstly, looking back, despite ups and downs, we have been witnessing a steady growth of China-US relations in the past 30 years. Uh, High-level exchanges are frequent and productive. For example, in 2008 alone, President Hu Jintao and President Bush met four times, exchanged 10 letters, and talked on the phone four times. In fact, President Bush broke the record of visiting China four times during when he was in office. Yeah. And President Hu Jintao also talked to his president-elect at that time, Mr. Obama, on November the 8th. They talked again on January the 30th this year. During these contacts, leaders set course for bilateral relations and provided guidance for future development. This has been an important driving force behind our bilateral relations over the years. Secondly, the interests of China and the United States are getting more and more interwoven. Cooperation areas are expanding. We are now the second largest trading partners for each other. Bilateral trade has expanded from 2.4 billion US dollars in 1979 to over 300 billion US dollars in 2008. For six consecutive years, China has been the fastest growing export market for the United States. The two countries are now the twin engines of the world economy, contributing as high as 40% to the world economic growth. Third, strategic and global significance of China-US relations is being recognized worldwide. We are in close contact and effective coordination on international and regional issues, such as the Korean nuclear issue, the Iranian nuclear issue, the Darfur, and so on and so forth. China and the United States are working together to fight transnational crimes, tackle climate change, and respond to natural disasters and epidemic diseases. Fourth, people-to-people -people contacts have been expanding. If I remember correctly, from 1949, when the People's Republic was founded, till 1972, when President Nixon visited China. Only about 2,000 US citizens visited mainland China. But now, every day, we have 5,000 people flying across the Pacific. So this is really a, a big increase. The two countries are also linked by 35 pairs of sister cities, provinces, and 145 pairs of tw uh, twin cities. If I remember correctly, the city of Baltimore has a sister, sister city in China called Xiamen, <laughs> a very beautiful uh, seaside city. Secondly, in the early days of the new US administration, just now I was talking about the history. Now we are turning to the, uh, what is happening right now. <laughs> In the early days of the new U.S. administration, China-U.S. relationship stands at a starting point, higher than ever before, and is faced with new opportunities. 
we are glad to see that China was not a hot topic during the U.S. election. Uh, in fact, you know, uh, we have uh, been watching the U.S. elections closely last year, and we found that the two candidates, and the two candidates together with, your, uh, with President Bush, they almost differ on everything. But there's one exception, that is Sino-U.S. relations. You can find more commonality among them than differences. <clears throat> so during their two, their two telephone conversations, President Hu Jintao and President Obama agreed to further expand China-U.S. cooperation. In the words of President Obama, the United States is committed to more positive and more constructive relation, relations with China. The two presidents also agreed to meet in London in April, and they invited each other to exchange visits. In addition, the presidents may also meet on the sidelines of G8 plus 5 in Italy, an APEC economic leaders meeting in Singapore this year. During his visit to the United States for the sixth round of the strategic dialogue, Chinese State Councilor Dai Bing Guo discussed China-U.S. relations with key members of the transitional team of the incoming Obama administration. On January the 23rd, Foreign Minister, Chinese Foreign Minister Yang Jiechi and Secretary Hillary Clinton exchanged views on bilateral relations over the phone. We are now working on the exchange of visit by the two foreign ministers. So therefore, communication between China and the United States in, uh, in the new era has been timely, smooth, and effective. This has helped ensure a good transition of our relations and presented a promising future for our future cooperation. Well, thirdly, faced with the current international financial crisis, China and the United States should turn uh, are working together to turn challenges into opportunities, trying to identify new dynamism for our trade and economic ties, and pushing for new and greater progress in the overall bilateral relations between our two countries. You know, in the Chinese language, uh, I would say quite a number of you uh, understands Chinese and may speak Chinese. Uh, the, uh, the word, you know, uh, crisis in Chinese is pronounced as wei ji. In fact, they are formed by two Chinese characters. Wei means danger, but ji means opportunity. So crisis in Chinese means danger plus opportunity. <laughs> and the two are inter-transformable. So since the current financial crisis broke out, China and the United States have worked together and jointly responded to the crisis by staying in touch with each other, coordinating economic and monetary policies and strengthening cooperation in the economic and especially financial area. While well, China has not pulled out funds from the US, and in fact, we, ha uh, we are now the number one uh, foreign country holding US uh, treasury bonds. <laughs> yeah. And we are going to hold that continuously. <laughs> we also supported the U.S. initiative to hold the G20 Leaders Summit on Financial Markets and the world economy and played a constructive role uh, during the meeting. Now the global implication of the current international financial crisis is growing deeper, taking its toll on world economic growth. Like other economies, the Chinese economy is not immune to the crisis. We are facing severe challenges, ranging from shrinking world market demand and overcapacity in some sectors to difficult business conditions, rising urban unemployment, and increasing pressure of economic slowdown. We have just you know, uh, celebrated the Chinese uh, uh, Spring Festival or the Chinese New Year. Uh, usually, you know, uh, the, uh, those uh, uh, rural, I mean, employ, in, employees who work in cities go back home for the uh, spring festival, and then they will come back to the city again. This year, you know, almost 20 uh, million of them 
did not go back to the city because of the, uh, you know, the economic pressure, the job you know, pressure. Yeah. I think uh, uh, so these 20 million plus the uh, 7 million you know, uh, uh, le uh, the, uh, the old, uh, you know, every year in the rural areas of China, we have more than 7 million you know, uh, oversupply of labor. So these two combined together, that is 27 million. I think it's about uh, five times the unemployment, uh, unemployment number of the United States. Let alone the uh, graduate, uh, the uh, graduating, uh, the graduates from the universities, and so on and so forth. So you can feel the uh, the pressure, you know, in China. To effectively meet these challenges, the Chinese government has made timely adjustments to the objectives of its macroeconomic policy, in order to focus on increasing domestic demand, maintaining growth, restructuring the economy promoting reform and implementing subsistence programs. We have swiftly adopted a proactive fiscal policy and a moderately relaxed monetary policy and introduced 10 measures to shore up domestic demand. Together, they make up a systematic and a comprehensive package aimed at ensuring steady and relatively fast economic growth. China's economy maintained relatively Stay steady and fast growth in 2008. The GDP grew by 9% and CPI was basically stable. The financial system functioned well and the liquidity and credit asset quality of banks stayed at a healthy level. level. When a large developing country like China keeps its economic house in order, it helps restore confidence in global economic growth and curb the spread of the international financial crisis. It also helps increase China's imports and overseas investment, boost world economic growth, and create more development and job opportunities for other countries. Steady and fast growth in China is a significant contribution to global financial stability and economic growth. With economic globalization, the world is getting smaller and smaller. It has become a global village. Mankind are faced with unprecedented opportunities as well as unprecedented challenges. Our destinies have never been so closely associated. Our interests are never so interwoven and interdependent. Uh, this afternoon, you know, I went to the State Department to meet with the new uh, deputy Secretary, uh, Deputy Secretary of the U.S. State Department, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Steinberg, and he, I remember a sentence, you know, very, uh, I think one of the remarks made by him is, uh, uh, is a very good one. He said that at this time, either we swim together or sink together because we are on the same boat. Yeah. Well, we have been watching with anxiety the financial crisis in the United States and the world, and we share your uneasiness and worries. Well, we are glad to see that the U.S. government has taken and will continue to take measures to revitalize the economy, and we hope your stimulus packages and plans will have positive effects. We hope that the American people will weather through the temporary difficulties and will recover fairly soon. We also hope that the interests of the Chinese investors in the United States will also be protected. This is in the interest of the United States, China, and the global economy. Mm -hmm. So we think that uh, this is a time that calls for closer cooperation between us, calling for mutual support between us, and calling for cooperation between us. Uh, I think that accusing the other side or calling the other side's name or blaming the other side or to take some you know, protectionist measures is not in the interest of us. 
and we'll get nowhere. I think that the United States, uh, the majority of the American people and their representatives will you know, make a right decision, a right choice. Well, fourthly, China and the United States should strengthen cooperation in the areas of climate change and new energy development. The Chinese government attaches great importance to climate change. Public awareness is growing. We have taken and will continue to take measures to balance economic development and environmental protection. And we will further enhance cooperation with the United States in this field. The prospects for China-US cooperation in energy and environmental protection are promising. Last year, not far away from here, in Annapolis, the two sides signed the 10-year energy and environmental cooperation framework during the strategic economic dialogue, which took place in the Naval Academy uh, in uh, Annapolis. So we hope that the uh, climate change and energy will become new highlights of China-US relations in the new US administration. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you know, while common interests and cooperation are the defining features of China-US relationship, we do not see eye to eye on everything due to our differences in culture, tradition, and level of development. I believe that as long as we address our differences through dialogue on the basis of equality and mutual respect, we will expand common ground and narrow differences. As long as the two sides respect each other, refrain from interfering in each other's internal affairs, observe the principles enshrined in the three China-US joint communiques, and properly handle sensitive issues like the Taiwan issue in our bilateral relations, we have every reason to believe that China-US relations will have a smooth transition and will make even greater progress in the next four years. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as uh, uh, introduced by uh, Mr. Burt, this is the 16th year since I started working on Sino-US relations. Uh, I still remember, you know, uh, from 1989 to 1993, I uh, worked in our embassy in Malta, a small Mediterranean island country south of Italy. And these are four years of long holiday. <laughs> so when I was recalled back in 1993, I thought that changing to a more challenging job might be a good idea. So I applied for the US Affairs Office and was accepted. Now 16, 16 years later, when I look back, you know, sometimes I think that uh, going back to Malta might not be a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> this relationship has proved to be more challenging than I expected. <laughs> but on, on the other hand, you know, working on this relationship has been very rewarding. And uh, the more I work on this relationship, the more I realize that our common interests surpass our differences. And even those differences, if you put them in the proper place and to handle them in a proper way, instead of dividing us, they complement each other. So I would very much like to invite all of you tonight to share my optimism for the long-term steady development of this relationship. And uh, I'm very, very glad to, uh, uh, to meet you here in Baltimore this evening. As I said, we are now still in the Chinese uh, New Year. And this year, we are bringing, uh, we are, uh, this year, it, uh, according to the Chinese lunar calendar, is the year of uh, ox. Uh, but I would like to translate that into the year of uh, bull. I think in light of the uh, economic difficulties all of us are facing, we do need a year of bull to pick us up. You know? So I wish you all a prosperous year of bull and wish for a good and steady a development of Sino-US relations in the year of uh, war. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. The uh, minister has agreed to answer questions. The floor is now open. In the past, over a number of years, it has been suggested by people in the West that China has manipulated its currency in order to get favorable trade relations. Um, China did make some minor adjustments in the past. Uh, this is still a, a, an object of differences. I'd like you to elaborate on both why, we, why people in the West are saying you're manipulating it and what your defense will be. Uh, I think it's uh, a good way for us to look at the IMB exchange rates you know, from a historical perspective. I remember in the uh, uh, 70s and 60s, uh, 70s and 80s, IMB used to be even, more, even stronger than it is today. At that time, the exchange rate between IMB and US dollar is about uh, uh, one, do one uh, equals to 1.8 or one equals two. And now it's uh, one, uh, one dollar equals to about uh, seven, uh, one dollar equals to about one, uh, seven IMB. Um, if you uh, look back I think that it's a very, 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 it is very important for us to remember that in July 2005, the uh, Chinese government, you know, adopted a very important policy, that is to uh, uh, to change the Chinese uh, exchange rate mechanism to a market-oriented, you know, uh, exchange rate mechanism, and since then, the IMB, you know against US dollar has appreciated about 21%, though there has been ups and downs you know, from time to time. So I think basically, you know, uh, I would, I would uh, not agree with uh, those who are accusing China of manipulating the uh, uh, currency. But on the other hand, I agree that there are still, I mean, a room for further I mean, uh, change uh, by China in that regard. So I think the uh, direction is good, and uh, China is uh, willing to continue along that road, but in a, you know, in a, uh, in a control, controllable way, taking into account the uh, uh, economic difficulties and financial turbulences uh, around us. I think it's, res it's a responsible approach by the Chinese government to do okay. it in that way. Okay, thank you. Thank you. What is the Chinese position on Iran obtaining nuclear weapons? Mm -hmm. If not opposed to it, why not? If opposed to it, how far is China prepared to go to prevent it? Well, I think uh, China and United States shared a lot on the question of uh, Iran, a nuclear issue. I think we share the same objective. First of all, we, neither of us want to see an Iran with nuclear weapons. Secondly, neither of us would like to see the stability in that part of the world to be you know, rocked up. And thirdly, we would like to see the non-proliferation regime you know, to be, uh, to be kept intact, you know. Uh, the differences between China and the United States, not always, sometimes, lies in the, uh, what is the best approach to achieve these goals. And we think that uh, a diplomatic way, through negotiations, and in a multilateral, I mean, uh, by, uh, on a multilateral forum, is more effective than uh, other ways. And we are very glad to note that President Obama, as well as his new administration, have been openly emphasizing more on the uh, diplomatic means uh, and the dialogue. So we hope that China and the United States can continue cooperating on this issue with the, uh, together with the uh, international community to see the goals I listed just now to be realized. Thank you.
Minister Xu, uh, Xie, uh, happy Chinese New Year. Uh, I wish you a prosperous year of bull. Thank you. Uh, I'm a writer with uh, Pharma Asia News, uh, based in Rockville, Maryland. Uh, we are very uh, interested in Chinese healthcare reform. Uh, last month, uh, the State Council approved uh, a package to invest, invest 850 billion yuan. That is more than 100 billion US dollars to healthcare uh, reform in three years. Uh, my question is, um, uh, because some uh, criticize uh, this uh, package because uh, it, uh, this program designates uh, special factories uh, to manufacture and uh, distribute those uh, uh, pharmaceutical products and uh, medical device products. Um, just uh, as you mentioned, uh, due to current economic crisis, uh, there also in the U.S. Uh, now, uh, people uh, are talking about buy American um, because uh, you know they they don't want to to spend the money. Uh, so uh, regarding this question, I want to ask you: um, as a U.S. Uh, pharmaceutical company or medical device maker, how it this company also can be benefiting? from the uh, Chinese, uh, this uh, West uh, investment and uh, the Chinese healthcare reform. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm not an expert, you know, on uh, uh, medicine, you know, <laughs> but uh, common sense of my knowledge of my country tells me that, uh, first of all, I mean, uh, the example you uh, raised just now is another, you know, manifestation of the developing nature of China. You know, though we have been uh, uh, developing so fast in the uh, past uh, two decades, but still, you know, the, not every Chinese have medical insurance, especially those in the uh, rural areas. So one of the uh, goal of the uh, Chinese government is to uh, provide, you know, uh, provide, you know, universal medical insurance coverage to all the people. So I'm very glad to hear what you said just now. Secondly, I think, uh, uh, I think it's a good policy for the, uh, for the uh, Chinese government to designate certain amount of the uh, uh, economic st stimulus package to the uh, medical insurance area. Uh, I think this is uh, good for the people and it's good for uh, a sustainable development of the Chinese economy. Uh, thirdly, I, though I'm not an expert, you know, and do not know the detail of this, uh, uh, of this, uh, you know, plan, uh, I would not rule out that uh, since this is the first time for Chinese to do that, I mean, it's a learning process. So, I would not rule out the possibility. There are some things that need to be perfected as time goes on. And I think we welcome advice, criticism, advice from not only, I mean, Chinese inside China, but also foreigners and our friends all over the world. You know. Fourthly, uh, I think the uh, US, the, not only the United States, but also, you know, uh, medical, uh, medicine manufacturing, you know, uh, corporations have, uh, I think, extensive participation in the Chinese, you know, uh, uh, economic development during the past uh, two or three decades. Uh, I remember in the year 2000 and, uh, 2001, when I was the uh, Council for, for Congressional Liaison, I accompanied, you know, uh, Senator Evan Bai, you know, from uh, Indiana to China, and we visited a American, you know, uh, American corporation in Suzhou, which is very near Shanghai. The name of that co company is uh, Eli Lilly, right. and I think they made very good. I mean, uh, they had very good cooperation with China. It's a joint venture between China and the United States. They not only produce the uh, best quality, you know, medicine and medical uh, facilities, but also, you know, sells very well on Chinese market. And so 
I mean, now on the Chinese market, I uh, would say that uh, um, people almost have no prejudice against, you know, foreign made or joint uh, or medicines made by, from uh, joint ventures. In fact, uh, people would, I mean, consider that to be of high quality, you know. And, and I have not seen, you know, uh, uh, any uh, government, you know, instructions uh, or policy, you know, to uh, to to uh, prejudice against, you know, foreign made or I mean, uh, joint venture made med uh, medical supplies. But you, but I have I have taken note of you, what you said, and I will uh, check with my colleagues in the embassy to see you know what is uh, what is. Uh, Can I follow up with you later? Yes, please. Okay. <clears throat> Minister, it is indeed a time of new beginnings. China celebrates Chinese New Year. The U.S. is still celebrating the uh, election of a new president under free and fair elections, uh, on the basis of freedom of conscience, freedom of speech, and freedom of the press. China, of course, has a very different political system. Uh, that does not allow for a free election of the government. Uh, do you agree that the cooperation and friendship of our two peoples would be greatly enhanced were China to embrace the universal values of freedom of speech and freedom of the press? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think uh, to have uh, you know freedom of speech, freedom of uh, you know worship. Uh, I think this is something, you know, uh, not only, you know, uh, uh, cherished here in the United States, but also common, you know, aspiration of the whole mankind. And that is why we consider these to be, you know, the, uh, the uh, uh, common values, you know. And the Chinese, you know, uh, though the tradition is very much different from United States. We have a long history, 5,000 years, and uh, United States was founded, uh, I mean, less than 300 years. Uh, but I think uh, even dating back to, uh, to the early days of, uh, of China, you know, uh, the, uh, the aspiration to have a for play of human talents, you know, to reduce the uh, limitation from the outside, to have a, uh, has, I mean, uh, uh, has been, uh, uh, mm, has been a important, I mean, a theme, you know, uh, if you look into the uh, Chinese history. Uh, about 2,500 years ago, there was a period in, uh, in China called you know, spring and autumn, you know, spring and autumn era, where you know, uh, different schools of thoughts are encouraged to flourish, just as 100 flowers are encouraged to uh, bloom you know, <laughs> in spring. And, so I think that it, it would be a misunderstanding to, uh, to say that uh, China is, uh, is uh, I mean, separated from the uh, uh, world community, you know, so far as uh, uh, human rights, you know, uh, individual, I mean, rights are concerned. Uh, second, uh, secondly, I would say that uh, but China do have a long period of uh, uh, sort of a feudal system. We were having we have we were having empress, you know, less than two hundred years ago, when the Americans, you know, have already, uh, I mean, uh, have uh, formed uh, United States, you know, by combining the thirteen colonies, you know, <laughs> uh, so. There do exist the uh, difference. What is the emperor? I mean, emperor means he is the uh, uh, he is the paramount paramount you know ruler, and whatever he said were the uh, were the law. Yeah. So 
I think this, so the long history of China on the one hand is a, uh, uh, is a rich, you know, uh, heritage from which we still benefit today. On the other hand, the long feudal, uh, I mean, history of China is also a, a burden. You know. mm. So, mm -hmm. I would say that, uh, you know, uh, uh, I was uh, just before the uh, before the uh, uh, the presentation. An old gentleman told me that uh, he visited China in 1980, and uh, I I think that if he visits China again and compare, you know, what he saw then and what he experienced now in China, then he will come up with a conclusion that China has not only progressed economically during the past 30 years, but also have progressed socially, including, you know, the rule of law, the, uh, you know, the, the, the individual rights, you know, the speech, uh, the, 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 right, uh, the freedom of speech, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, Nowadays, if you, uh, I mean, we have quite a number of uh, congressional, you know, delegations visiting China. And after they are coming back from China, they said that the, uh, the experience they have in China is very much different from the impression they got before leaving for China. Yeah. And, uh, Nowadays, I mean, if you, I, if you have the opportunity to go to China, aside from having, you know, meetings with government officials, I would advise you to have uh, conversations with those who, ordinary people on the street, you know, including taxi drivers. <laughs> and you will find that uh, they are very eager to communicate with you. And they are ready to talk to you, to you, you know, to, 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 to express, you know, their thoughts to you without, I mean, uh, feeling the, uh, uh, I mean, the pressure that they might be persecuted because of what they said. And if you go onto the streets of uh, China, you will find, I mean, more public uh, more publications on those news stands than here in the United States. Not all of them, you know, are praising the government. Yeah. Yeah. Some are criticizing, criticizing, you know, the government. I can give you a, an example. You know, in 1999, after the bombing of the Chinese embassy in Belgrade, you know, there has been a roar of criticism of the foreign ministry, which I'm working for being too, I mean, uh, too, too soft, you know, when dealing with the United States. And I remember that then Chinese foreign minister, Yang, uh, foreign minister Tang Jiaxue, received a letter from an ordinary citizen there's no word in it, but there are several calcium pills implying that you have been too soft. You need some calcium to stiffen you. <laughs> you know? So I would say, uh, I mean, it's very hard to imagine if it's uh, authoritarian, totalitarian, I mean, oppressive, I mean, a society, how can an ordinary citizen, you know, dare to write a letter, you know, expressing his opposition, you know, to the Chinese foreign minister, you know. Yeah. Well, again, I would say that uh, uh, as, I mean, uh, any other countries in the world, uh, China is not perfect. 
I mean, so far as this human rights is concerned. And we are continuing along the road of uh, reform and uh, to uh, improve, you know, and to, 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 uh, to uh, protect people's, you know, individual rights in a, much, in a more effective way. <laughs> Thank you. I will keep it short. Uh, Minister, I would like to go back to something you mentioned at the beginning, which is buying treasury bills. Um, as someone who's lived in the United States for 20 years, I'm originally from Scotland, I would like to thank China for buying all those treasury bills <laughs> and holding Th Thank them. you for your understanding. You know? yeah. <laughs> and holding them at what can only be described as a terrible rate of return of approximately 2% a year. On top of that, um, because don't, of trade... Don't discourage the, him, please. No, no, I'm not discouraging. I'm a, there is a point to this, believe it or not, and it's an important one. Um, on top of that, uh, China has managed to build a trade surplus of $2.3 trillion, at the same time as the United States has built a financial system with $2.9 trillion of liabilities. So I was wondering if you'd like to buy a bank, <laughs> or several, uh -huh. perhaps a whole financial system. And my point in mentioning this is because the global imbalances are very, very important to both the United States and China. And the old model where we printed dollars so we could have credit cards to buy the stuff that you made in Guangzhou, which was then sold in Walmart, which you then bought treasuries with, which then gave us dollars, which we could make credit cards with so we could buy stuff. That's gone. It's done for both of us. And China is going to have a hard time, as the United States, in realizing that the export-dependent economy that kept both of us going for 15 years is now gone. You, measure, you mentioned 20 million unemployed. This is the beginning, and only the beginning. I would like your opinion on how you think China is going to turn itself around from an export-led juggernaut of trade to a domestically oriented consumptive economy, which is going to hold together because that really is the challenge that you face. I think uh, it's uh, true that China uh, do benefit from the uh, uh, bilateral trade between China and the United States. Uh, secondly, I would say that uh, uh, the bilateral trade between us, not only uh, China is not the only benefit, beneficiary. United States is also the case. Uh, thirdly, I would say that uh, you know the uh, the uh, the uh, the money you know China uh, accumulated through bilateral trade. Then we use these to buy the U.S. Treasury bond. I mean, this I think is something that should be welcome instead of being criticized. <laughs> we use it in a very good way, you know, to, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to uh, I, I, I would rule out the possibility that anyone among, you know, uh, uh, the participants here to tonight would ask for China to withdraw from the uh, U.S. Treasury bond, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and fourthly, uh, I would say that, uh, hmm, if you look back on the, the uh, world economic history, you will find that uh, countries you know, at the uh, initial stage of economic development and who have, a, you know, uh, who have an edge in the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, low cost laborer, you know, the, uh, uh, usually you know, concentrate on uh, concentrate uh, usually, you know, uh, uh, you know, at the beginning stage, be be beginning stage, you know, concentrate on uh, increasing export to the outside. But this is, I mean, uh, unsustainable, and the Chinese government have also realized that. I think uh, starting. Uh, Five years ago, uh, the government have been putting more emphasis on the uh, uh, tapping of the uh, domestic, uh, do domestic I mean, uh, consumption. And uh, 
the statistics show that for the past five years in a, in a row, China's domestic uh, consumption has been increasing you know, uh, at a rate of uh, 12 to 13 percent, which is unprecedented in the world. And uh, fourthly, you know, in fact, I think it is not in China's interest to, uh, to, to continue to have a big trade surplus. Rather, China is seeking to a sort of a, a balance, you know, though not with specific country, but worldwide, you know. And that is why China have been increasing export from the outside during the past few years. As I said in my presentation just now, China has been the fastest growing export market of US products for six years already. And uh, uh, if I remember correctly, the US export to the rest of the world increased by about 68% during the past six years. But your export to China has increased by 680% during the past six years. So on the one hand, you know, uh, I think we uh, should uh, keep in mind that uh, the trade deficit should be addressed. And I am also for addressing this. But on the other hand, we should also see the progress towards that end. So I hope that uh, China and United States can work together to uh, bring about a win-win situation for us. This is especially important at this moment because accusing each other, blaming each other is not solution. Uh, the only solution lies in joining hands and to work together. Thank you. I have to apologize to all of you who have waited patiently to ask questions. Our time is up, Mr. Ambassador or Mr. Minister. We've been uh, grateful for this evening. It's been marvelous. We're honored that you were here. Thank you very much. Thank you.